Today on Basic Bytes, I'm going to be showing you how I heatsink a Commodore 64C and talking about some of the design differences that help this model run much cooler than its breadbox predecessors. Greetings, it's JC at Basic Bytes, and today I'm going to be showing you how I heatsink a Commodore 64C, and specifically a 64C with PCB assembly number 250469, otherwise known affectionately as the shortboard. This is the board that you will find in the majority of 64Cs as it was developed in 1987 and then saw the computer right through to the end of its run during the 1990s. If you have one of the very early Commodore 64Cs that was made in 1986, then what you will have is a longboard 64C and it's very easy to tell if you have one of these even from the exterior because the board is long enough that it actually obstructs these front bottom vents by about a centimeter. If you have a longboard 64C, this video is not really for you, as those are simply a slightly updated version of the main boards that were contained within the earlier breadbox style Commodore 64s, and they output substantially more heat than the short boards, to the point where I would suggest they need a separate video in order to address their heat sinking concerns. Because I want this video to be informational as well as instructional, I will be taking a little bit of time to talk about the design of the shortboard as it pertains to heat. This board was a drastic improvement over its longboard predecessors in numerous respects, including its thermal design, which runs so much cooler that the difference is like night and day. In my opinion, heat sinking a few select chips on this board is merely an extra long-term preventative measure rather than an attempt to address any sort of present concern about chips failing. Heat synced or not, the shortboard tends to be a very stable system in comparison to the longboards where several chips that ran quite hot were in fact known to die with some regularity. I will assume that you have the metal RF shield which has the keyboard brackets riveted onto it and also has several metal tongues which indicate which chips Commodore thought could benefit from some heat sinking in the first place. However, if you are unfortunate enough to have the version with the two separate keyboard brackets and the cardboard RF shield that simply wraps around the main board, that's okay. All that means is that if you wish to heat sink any specific chips after this video is over, you can inexpensively obtain some small aluminium heat sinks with a diameter of less than 15 millimeters and then simply apply them to the appropriate chips. One in the center should be more than suitable and there are two ways to adhere these. One is that you can obtain a small tube of thermal adhesive which is like a glue that you squeeze on or also available is heat sinking tape. Heat sink tape is double-sided thermally conductive tape which you simply cut to size and then press on to the heat sink and the chip. So let's take a closer look at what we are interested in heat sinking on this board and why. There are three chips that were indicated by the metal tongues on the RF shield which we should be taking notice of. Those are the 8500 microprocessor, the 8562 VIC-2 aka video chip, and the 8580 SID aka sound chip, noting that the part number on your VIC-2 chip will be different if your C64 is the PAL model rather than the NTSC model, which is what we are looking at here. On this particular board, those also happen to be the three chips that are 
socketed, and while that is common, it is by no means consistent, especially where the microprocessor is concerned, as it is, just as often as not, soldered directly to the board. In any case, Commodore chose wisely when it selected those three chips to be the ones that received some heat sinking from the shield, as even after prolonged use, those are the only ones that get what I would even describe as moderately warm, while the others produce so little heat that none of them are of much concern to us in this video. Interestingly, while the CPU in modern PCs is our primary heat concern, the microprocessor here runs distinctly cooler than either of the other two chips. In fact, some versions of the metal shield do not apply heat sinking to the microprocessor, but instead merely have an area above it cut out so that any heat that rises from the processor can simply escape through the top vents of the Commodore 64. My own original Commodore 64C, which I am keeping completely unmodified in storage for nostalgic reasons, has just such a cutout in its shield, and if yours does too, of course you'll need to decide if you wish to additionally paste an aluminium heatsink onto that chip. As for the 8000 series VIC-2 chip and SID chip, if you are familiar with how hot their 6000 series predecessors ran in the breadbox Commodore 64s, you will probably be pleasantly surprised at how cool these chips run in comparison. Of course, one of the contributing factors to heat is voltage. The higher the voltage, the more the heat. And, while all of the integrated circuits in the Commodore 64 run off a 5-volt primary voltage, the 6000 series VIC-2 and SID chips required a 12-volt secondary voltage, as compared to these two, wherein the SID chip's secondary voltage has been dropped from 12 volts to 9 volts, while the VIC-2 has been re-engineered to run purely off 5 volts only, thus explaining why these chips are able to run so much cooler than their predecessors. In addition to the obvious less voltage equals less heat, there is another improvement in play here, of which the 8500 microprocessor is a great example. It's obvious why the 8000 series VIC-2 chip and SID chip would require new part numbers because the differences in operating voltage mean that they are not interchangeable with their 6000 series predecessors. However, the 8500 microprocessor is interchangeable with its 6510 predecessor. Well, that being the case, what makes the 8500 microprocessor any different from the 6510? And the answer is silicon manufacturing process. If you've been around the world of computers for any length of time, you've almost certainly heard the term CMOS, which is a silicon process for manufacturing integrated circuit chips. Well, before CMOS, there was HMOS and NMOS. The 6510 microprocessor, as is found in the breadbox Commodore 64s, was made with the NMOS process, while the 8500 CPU, as we find on the shortboards, was manufactured using the HMOS process. Why does that have any bearing here? Well, as it turns out, the HMOS process has superior energy dissipation to the NMOS process, thus explaining why even directly equivalent parts, if manufactured in HMOS, can in fact run cooler than their NMOS predecessors. Moving on to the instructional part of today's video, how to heatsink your Commodore 64C shortboard edition in three easy steps.
By this method, the first step is required, the second step is recommended, and the third step is optional for those who wish to be extra protective in regards to their equipment. The first step is making sure that your shield is in shape. These metal shields can bend out of form very easily. Often, when I open a Commodore 64, I will do the tap test, meaning that I simply tap on each of the heat sinking tongues. More often than not, I find one or more of them responds by going click, 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 and that simply means that the tongue is in fact not making proper contact with the chip. Thus, for starters, make sure that all of your tongues are sufficiently bent down to make contact, and further to that, endeavor to angle the ends so that as much surface area as possible is contacting the chip. Mine have been angled so that the shield does in fact spring back up when it hasn't been screwed down. The second step, which is highly recommended to help ensure that the metal shield does its job, is to apply a thermally conductive compound to each of the ICs that the heat sinking tongues will be in contact with. Oftentimes, this is why you will open up a Commodore 64 and find globs of thermal grease applied to various chips inside. Here, what we have is a lot of margin of error when you're manually bending a piece of metal that you're hoping will make good contact against an IC, and that's why using thermal grease requires that instead of just a paper-thin layer, you put a somewhat substantial glob of it onto the chip in order to ensure that the entire end of the tongue can sink down into it and make good thermal contact, and thus why I am not a fan of it, as it tends to make a mess, and you will find yourself scraping it off and reapplying it each time you subsequently open your Commodore 64 for cleaning or maintenance. These bright blue squares that have appeared on the chips are thermally conductive silicone pads. For those of us in the modern PC world, I know that we tend to cringe when we hear silicone thermal pad, as they are often rated extremely poorly in terms of their efficiency. However, those ratings are in the context of modern CPUs and GPUs and the extreme amount of heat dissipation that those sorts of chips require. In my opinion, for this application, they are in fact the perfect thing to ensure that the heat from your ICs gets efficiently communicated up into the metal shield without making a mess inside your 64. Sheets of thermal silicone can be obtained quite inexpensively from overseas, generally only at the cost of a few dollars. Some of them require that you cut them to size, while others, such as this one, come pre-perforated into squares. Simply be aware that there is plastic that needs to be peeled off both sides of the silicone, as it is actually quite tacky when removed from the plastic, despite that it is not an adhesive. These particular thermal pads are 2 millimeters thick, and for best results, I recommend obtaining ones that are 1 to 2 millimeters thick, as anything outside that range is probably either a little on the thin side or overkill. Furthermore, make sure that you do not have the thermal pads in place when you are shaping your shield in step 1. Rather, make sure that the heat sinking tongues on the shield are making firm contact with the ICs all on their own. The thermal pads are highly compressible, so when they are added in the second step, they will squish in between to make a nice tight thermal seal. And finally, step three, for those who wish to be extra protective, you can very inexpensively order an entire bag of these little 8.8 .8 millimeter aluminium heat sinks 
and using either thermal adhesive or double-sided heat sink tape as per your preference, adhere one to each of the metal tongues and they will very efficiently suck up any heat that's being communicated into the shield and radiate it out. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. No fuss, no muss, nothing glued to your chips, and no mess to clean up the next time you open your Commodore 64. If you found this interesting or entertaining, please like and subscribe to Basic Bytes for more. You can also find us online at basicbytes.ca. Thank you for watching.